Welcome to Learning the Social Sciences. Today we're going to be covering research methods in psychology. Psychology is a science? Now think about your science classes, whether it be biology, chemistry, physics, anatomy. Think about what you do in those classes. Well, you follow the scientific method, you're making hypotheses, and you're learning about theories and laws. Now think about psychology. What makes psychology a science? What do psychologists do that makes them scientists? So of course they're following the scientific method and they're following scientific principles. And hopefully this presentation will help you see more why psychology is a science. So thinking of the characteristics of a science. First, psychologists use the empirical methods. They research and they have controls and they manipulate variables. And of course they have an objective, uh, and, and of course they have an objective to their experiment. Uh, they allow for hypothesis testing also, and results can be replicated. And of course their findings allow researchers to predict future occurrences. In other words, they're going through the steps of the scientific method. So why do we need research in psychology? I thought we're just kind of looking at people or talking to people and finding out answers. Well, we need it because just asking people how and why they felt and acted can be very misleading. Common sense isn't all it's cracked up to be. We might be having something like hindsight bias, influencing us and maybe causing us to have, well, wrong interpretations or something known as the I knew it all along phenomenon. A study in 1997 and 1979 have shown that unanticipated scientific results and historical happenings can indeed seem like obvious common sense, but it's not the case. And it's especially not the case at the time. For example, what would you think if you read, psychologists have found that separation weakens romantic attraction. Is there anything that you would think of that could actually work for that? Like any statement that would back that up? Well, we have that saying out of sight, out of mind, right? So, but wait, do we have an opposite saying to that? Think about it. When you're apart, does the heart maybe grow fonder? Hmm. Maybe we do have two differing statements depending on the situation that you want to choose. So now let's jump into anagrams. We do have errors in how we recall information or how we explain how we think and act. This is why we need to do research. Our everyday thinking is limited, not by only our after the fact common sense, but also we have overconfidence. So right now there is some letters on the screen. So right now we have five letters on the screen. What is the word that those letters make when you put it together? Water. How long would it take you to do this? Uh, if you had like an entire sheet of five letter commonly used words, how long would it take you if you had five letter words that you usually don't see that often? For example, look at this one. Have you figured it out? It's chaos. So sometimes if we were to do an anagram study and we would maybe start off by, well, you know, showing a few anagrams and their instant answer right away, people might start to be like, oh yeah, I got that right away. That was super easy. Or starting with like, I don't know, four letter words and then moving it up, people might start being a little bit overconfident about the situation and think they might solve these anagrams a lot faster than how they actually do. So they might have overconfidence. And we see overconfidence in a lot of areas. Think about this. Only 2% of students entering college do not think that they're going to make it. Now think about this. Around 50% do not earn their four-year college degree within four years. Some need to take a little bit more time. And also some programs actually need you to actually do a five to six year program anyway. Uh, but curiosity, skepticism, and humility help make modern science possible. And it helps us not only overestimate our intuition, which could be wrong. So there is a study that we're going to be going over no right now called the Wells and Branfield study. And it talks about eyewitness accounts. So say you witness a crime. 
Are you trustworthy? Are you trustworthy to sit on a stand in front of a jury and say your account and also state who did the crime? Well, the Wells Branfield study showed that, you know, you could distort the eyewitness memory. How? Well, professors Gary Wells and Amy Branfield from Iowa State University conducted a study to see how suggestible eyewitnesses are. They had participants watch an eight second grainy security camera clip that showed a man walking inside a store. They slowed down the footage so participants could really look at it and try to pull out as much information as they possibly could. Now, when they finished, they were told that the man in the video murdered a security guard outside of the store. And actually, this is actually based off a case that that did happen. But the participants were only then shown a photo spread of five people that was used in a case to identify the killer. However, the researcher made one change to this lineup. They took out the photo of the actual killer. So no matter what, they would pick the wrong person. Well, the researchers then separated the people into three groups. One group made their identification and received no feedback, just like, okay, thank you, goodbye. Uh, the second group uh, made a wrong choice, and one of the others was the killer. You just kind of say, well, you know, you tried. I'm sorry, you're wrong. And the third group, it was like, woo, good job. You definitely found him. Awesome. So after the identification, the participants were then asked about different aspects of their identification process and how certain they were with finding the right person in the lineup. The results showed that the third group that was congratulated for what they did definitely had a higher confidence level than the other two groups. The vast majority stated that they had a great angle to identify the subjects and that their judgment was sound and accurate and they were really, really good at identifying people. They also were far more willing to testify just based off of watching a grainy footage. So we can see right there that people became skewed. And this is going to change how policing is done, how investigating is done. Because think if a police officer would be in a room with somebody who is looking at a lineup and the police officer would then give a positive feedback to the person who just identified somebody. Well, that could definitely skew things going into the trial even. The person might have a lot more confidence saying, yes, they did the crime when that person might actually be innocent. So it's important that we look at critical thinking, thinking that does not blindly accept arguments and conclusions. We have to go and examine all assumptions. We have to discern hidden values. We have to evaluate evidence and assess conclusions in all areas, especially all areas within the realm of psychology. Critical thinkers ask questions and psychologists ask a lot of questions. And this has helped psychologists to discover and debunk a whole bunch of assumptions. You know, for pointing out an assumption that can be wrong, sleepwalkers, they're not acting out their dreams. They're just not. I mean, think about it. If, you know, we're going for somebody who's waking up in the middle of the night and possibly just going in the refrigerator to just stare at it. They're not dreaming that they're staring in the fridge. So there you go. So this was part one on our lecture series on research methods. Thank you very much for joining us. Bye-bye.